chapter 2. Uh, if you want, though, you can open up your Bible to Acts chapter 14, put your thumb there, we're going to read through Acts chapter 14 a little bit later. But uh, Paul is, is continuing to deal with this situation, and, and I couldn't help but think of Cinderella. You know, what? Cinderella? Do you remember that? That's, uh, what was that kind of coach made from? Does everybody remember? A pumpkin, right? Just a pumpkin. I mean, a pumpkin is just like this big, heavy weight. There's a promise of pie if your mom makes pumpkin pie like mine does. But it's just this big lump of, of squash or whatever it is. And, and it gets turned into this beautiful coach. And then at midnight, you know what happens, right? But I thought to myself, if I was Cinderella at 1159, I would have said to Prince Charming, I would have said, you know, I bet your hand in marriage I could turn that carriage into a pumpkin. <laughs> so I would have. Well, anyways, we, uh, we come to uh, this idea of, of the law being like a pumpkin. It's this big, heavy promise of something better, but itself in itself is just a pumpkin. I mean, unless you want to go to the corn base with a pumpkin and shoot a pumpkin at something. I mean, it's, it's not the most useful of things, but it has the promise of something more. And so we have uh, this promise of through the law of something better. We call that grace. And so law, to me, is like a pumpkin. It's there, it's bulky, it's big, it's heavy, it weighs a lot, and it's interesting. It's, it's there, but it promises something even more important. And so before we get to Galatians chapter uh, 2, we're actually going to take a look at this fellow. Oh, the picture's a little dark, but anyways, it's a centurion. Probably one of the most important <laughs> centurions in the Bible. There's several, but this is Cornelius. This is from Acts chapter 10. And this, for, for us Gentiles, those of us who are non-Jews, this was our day of Pentecost. This was the day everything changed for the Gentiles. Up to this point, all the promises of God had been kind of held close to the chests of the Jewish nation. It wasn't for everybody else. Interestingly enough, I did a, I did a study when I was going to Crandall. I did a study on the Jewish nation as a light to the Gentiles. And I did this study and come to find out that all through the Old Testament, it's, it's in all the five divisions of the Psalm books, it's, it's plastered there, it's in Isaiah, it's all through the Old Testament, this idea that the Jewish nation was to be a light to the Gentiles. They're supposed to be so in love with God that the Gentiles would come and they'd gather to the temple and worship. And we see that in Acts, around the time of Jesus, this was starting to happen. Gentiles were looking at these other gods and like, this is baloney. There's nothing real, there's nothing substantial to this. And so they started to become what was known as God-fearers. They weren't allowed in the temple, but they wanted to worship God. And so Cornelius was outstanding. He was a centurion, not just of any legion, but of an Italian legion. Well, what does that mean? Why is that important? Because Rome is in Italy, right? The Romans are from Italy. Romans have conquered the world. And if you were of an Italian Mamma mia, delicio pizza, you know. If you, were from, if you were from the family of Italy, you weren't just a conscript. You were, you were even more special. So this was an Italian centurion. And so we have these, this, this group in Caesarea, or they have soft seas, but Caesarea, uh, or Kaiser, area, however you want to pronounce this. And he was there, and he was known from the Jews' point of view, as an honorable man. He cared for the poor. He offered up alms to the poor. He prayed to God. He was a God-fearer. And yet at the same time, in this time of day, the Jewish people didn't like the Romans very much because they were under captivity. He was hated and loved at the same time. And so Cornelius goes about his business, seeking God, chasing God, and lo and behold, an angel appears to Cornelius and says to him, Cornelius, your good works, your alms, your prayers, all those things have come up before me as a memorial. I want you to get Peter to come and tell you what to do. This blew Cornelius' mind away. Being a man of authority and a man of position, he said, Guys, soldiers, you, you, and you, and you, Go get Peter. We know he's in Joppa. Where's Joppa? Well, you got to remember, Joppa would be about as far as Sussex is from here. 
So he sent his soldiers, some different people, to go out all the way to Sussex, we'll say, and to go and get Peter. And meanwhile, Peter is minding his own business. You know, this is Acts chapter 10. A lot of things have happened. The Jewish people are, are being preached the gospel, the good news about the law being the foretaste of grace, of what Christ has done on the cross. And so Peter is summoned, but not before an angel visits Peter, or the Lord gives Peter a vision and says, I want you to go with these men, these Gentiles that are going to come to you. And you've got to realize the cultural context the kosher laws, the laws about dealing with Gentiles, they weren't even allowed to invite a Gentile into their homes, let alone hang out with them. And God made it abundantly clear to Peter, this is to be no more. I want you to go with these people. I'm saying it's okay. What was unclean it has been made clean. I want you to go to these Gentiles. You can imagine from Peter's point of view, imagine the chief of police of Sussex in all those Golden ginger ale drinkers, those Gentiles. Want me to come to them? Well, God had prepared Peter. I think in some ways maybe God chose the most stubborn apostle. It's like, ooh, this guy's stubborn. If we start with him, he'll give us no problems later. Okay, so Peter, you go to the chief of police of Sussex and their golden ginger ale drinkers. And I want you to bring them this, this grace, this knowledge about what to do now. What blows my mind? The angel was not allowed to preach the gospel. Could he have? Yep. The angel's role was to send Cornelius to a man who was to preach the gospel. A man or a woman could preach the gospel and share and change someone's life. It's our mission that God has given us. God didn't send the angels to do it. He sent Peter. And so Peter goes and preaches the gospel and tells Cornelius what to do. He enters the home of a Gentile, which was forbidden. He would have had to have a ritual bath to get himself cleaned up afterwards. And then he goes into his house and then stays for many days. But Peter did something really wise, you know that? He brought some people with him. He was in a place called Joppa, and so he brought some believers with him, and they stayed with him too. He told them the vision, he brought them, he brought witnesses. Pretty smart idea. But as I was studying this, I learned something absolutely beautiful. If you look in the Old Testament, it's the prophet Jonah, who in my eyes has been the prophet to the Gentiles, because you know, he, he was told by God to go to the Assyrians and, and tell them about the Lord and to repent, and he didn't want to do this because he knew that God was a merciful God. These Assyrians were bad news. I mean, the hate crimes. I mean, it was terrible. One of the details was too gross how they torture people. It was horrendous. If there was war trials on, these generals and these Assyrians would be on trial for, for inhumane acts. And so, Jonah decides, no way, God, I'm not doing this. And he goes to a place to catch a boat. Do you know what that place was called? Joppa. He goes to Joppa. And he tells it out of there. I think it's amazing that Joppa, again, is, is the starting place of a journey where Gentiles can learn about repentance and forgiveness. And so these Jopites, for lack of better terms, come with Peter and hear and see and witness and testify that Gentiles can now come to relationship with a loving, living Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing. And so we find that Paul comes into uh, this ministry of, of reaching out to, to Gentiles. There's a special gift. And he says in Galatians 2, he talks about how, how Peter has this amazing gift with the, with the Jews. And, and he's been ordained to reach the Gentiles. And things are going well. And, and so he's, he's going about his, his missionary journeys. And then we come to Acts chapter 14, verse 26. And that's where if you have your Bible out in the NIV, your pew Bibles are all NIV. Uh, we come to Acts chapter 14, verse 26, and we're going to read to 15, 1 to 3. That says this. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. A lot of Gentiles were getting saved. On arriving there, they gathered the church together, 
and reported all that God had done through them and had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch, this is where things get messy, and were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church set them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenician Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This new news made all the believers very glad. They had been freed from the law in so many different ways. And now here people come along and say, oh, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Oh, my goodness. Salvation is free. There's no works that need to be added to it. There's different, uh, some people have even taught that unless you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. No. Unless you're baptized, you're not saved. No. We look at Scripture. There's nothing added to it. It's the ABC. You accept Christ. You, you believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth that what He has done and you shall be saved. It's good to take a class with Pastor Andrew before baptism and have a membership, but it's not required for salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God. This pumpkin, which was turned into a coach, a beautiful coach, is now trying to be turned back into a pumpkin. The work was good, but the Judaizers were like Abraham Lincoln. The trouble with quotes on the internet is that you can never know if they're genuine. That's obviously the Photoshop and tamper with, right? Yeah. Abraham Lincoln wasn't taking a selfie with an Apple phone. <laughs> they were taking the truth and turning it into a half truth, the most dangerous kind. But God knew this would come. He knows us humans really well. And so He prepared servants to deal with this situation. You know, you can't get angry about something unless you're passionate about it. And so God developed this fellow named Paul of Tarsus. In Galatians 2.1, it's one of the shortest sentences uh, in any of his writing, because it's just Paul just passing over something, but it's so vital. And it says this in Galatians 2.1, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and I took Titus along also. After 14 years, God had been training and preparing Paul for just this moment. Just these kind of things. And sometimes we, we forget that we need to go through the processes that God has put in place. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Paul took Barnabas and took Titus with him in mission. Sometimes we just think, okay, so a couple guys with him. Titus was a Gentile. By Paul hanging around Titus, he was breaking all the Jewish customs. He was hanging around, talking, sharing food with a Gentile. And if you keep reading in that first chapter of chapter 2 of Galatians, uh, it tells us that these Judaizers tried to convince, tried to peer pressure, tried to push Titus as a grown man into circumcision. But he wouldn't have anything of him. See, you're nuts. That's not what Jesus said. And so we come to Galatians chapter 2, verse 3, and, and Titus is trying to be pressured. And then we kind of find out that, oh my goodness, Peter has fallen under this pressure. It says that Peter won't even sit with the Gentiles when these certain people come around. He's being pressured. So aren't you a good Jew? Aren't you a good Jew, Peter? What are you doing sitting with those guys? I'm thinking, wait a second. We just read in Acts chapter 10 that Peter's the guy that got this thing started. And now he's embarrassed about it? Isn't he the one that got this whole thing started? No, he's not. God is the one who got this first thing started. God is the one who chose the Gentiles. And I praise God that the apostles were not perfect. <clears throat> praise God that he can use imperfect people and people like Peter who got caught up in peer pressure. You know what? Man, I, I mess up from time to time. Not very often, really. Don't ask Jack or my wife or my kids. 
But Peter fell into this wishy-washy double-mindedness. Uh, or was it that he was conflicted? Was he conflicting? Was he wrestling with doctrinal issues? Trying to find out what is the truth? I mean, God spoke to him in such a special way. Actually had a vision. He saw the Holy Spirit of God pour on these Gentiles. But it's funny how you can have those incredible moments and then a short time later you start to doubt whether they actually happened. Sometimes it happens with your salvation. You pray to God and say, God, come and save me. And you have this wonderful experience. And then a couple days later, like, did that really happen? Am I nuts? Right? Because my friends are, what? And maybe pressure of life happens and you wonder, was it real? Well, it was real. Don't doubt it. Peter, though, by the grace of God, and a sharp argument with Paul <laughs> ends up becoming getting his senses back in order. Gets reminded about the importance of our Gentiles, us being allowed into the covenant, into the grace. It's amazing, even as you go to Second Peter, Peter's last letter, he's coming to the end of his ministry, and he even takes time. He warns against the Judaizers, but he takes time to say this about Paul. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own distraction. The gospel is clear. Sometimes doctrine and these things, they're tough. You need to wrestle, you need to chew, you need to not be afraid to ask questions. Sometimes you come to a wall, and then when you get to that place, you come and talk to someone who's not afraid to walk with you, and chew, and ask questions, and think, how does this work? But more importantly, Paul was defending salvation. People are trying to put the law above grace. But I'll tell you, grace is not the law. Let me show you what the law is for. Because I often wonder, what is the, if the law is no good, if the law is just a pumpkin. You know, we don't, and we want, we want this coach, we want this coach to turn back to a pumpkin. If the law is a pumpkin, what is it actually good for? Well, we say it's the promise of something else, but what I have found that the law does, I've asked Don to help me with this. Don, can you hold this? Let's see how far this goes. If I want to know what the limits are or something, if I want to know how far I can go, if I want to know the distance, if I want to know the measurement of what something is, I need a standardized system to tell me what it actually is. And this is all that the law is. The law shows us what sin is. The law shows us what's right and what's wrong. The law lays down for us what it cost Christ to free us from the burden of sin. The law was impossible to fulfill. Abraham was by grace. We'll get into that next time we speak on Galatians. You can let her know this is my favorite part of these things. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> In an instant, when Christ died on the cross, the law just became a measuring tape. Just to show us what was done for us. My friends, we are under grace. Sometimes people still try and put law on us. But when we look at the scriptures, we see it was all paid for. Every single last penny. Because the law cannot free you. The law cannot take the bottle that was on Stuart's finger and cannot rescue you from those situations. We need something much more effective than a blunt object. There's no way a pumpkin's going to get that off his finger. Well, he loses his finger. But... The law <coughs> tells us that we're not good enough. What I think is amazing is that Cornelius was a good man. He prayed. He gave alms. He did all the right things. But do you know what? I think it's amazing. God still wanted him to hear the gospel. God still wanted him to be in right relationship with him. Cornelius was an incredible man. And you know what? God heard his prayers. But God wanted more than that from him. 
God wanted more for Cornelius, not just from him. You know what God wanted with Cornelius? He wanted a relationship. He wanted to be Abba Father, Daddy God. He didn't want to wait to the judgment throne seat to make his decision. He wanted to have a relationship now. Cornelius was a good man. But God wanted more than just for Cornelius to be a good man. He wanted him to experience the salvation of Jesus Christ now. The blessings of following God now. He wanted the best for Cornelius now. It's an interesting study. It's complicated. It's messy. We know that we can't measure up to the law. We're not able to. But grace has made a way. You know, it's just like losing weight. I can't just make up my own mind how I'm going to lose weight. You know, I can't just say, gosh, I'm going to eat all the pie and cake in the house. That'll help me lose weight. No, no, no. There's things put in place for me to lose weight if I'm going to lose weight. Same thing with salvation. I can't just choose how salvation is going to take place. That's foolish. There's things like the cross and grace that have been put in place that we need to get a hold of. You don't wait till you're good enough to call out for salvation. You have been invited into a loving relationship with God. The only catch that I see is that, now look at Galatians 2.10, is that God will ask you to love others as well. Like you've been loved. Forgive others like you've been forgiven. The good news is that Jesus Christ loves you and saved you forever. I'll ask the worship team to come up and I'm going to have a word of prayer with you all. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you knew there'd be people trying to add to grace. Lord, you knew there'd be people trying to add stuff to it, and you raised up people like Paul. Lord, I thank you that you've included us Gentiles into your plan of salvation, that we can come into a relationship with you, be full of your Holy Spirit, be motivated and freed up to do the work that you call us to, that we might bear fruit that lasts, baptizing people in your name and teaching them all the things that you've taught us, making disciples who make disciples. God, I ask for your freedom in our lives. Lord, if we have attached law to your grace, Lord, if there are the unlovables in our life, Lord, help us to love those. If there's people that we've set aside, like maybe the Jewish people said, Titus, oh, he's a Gentile, I can't love him, or Cornelius, even that. Those are Gentiles. Lord, help us to find room in our hearts to love others. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your grace that's in our lives. Give us strength, Lord to follow after you. Pray these things in your name. Amen.